President Trump just announced a second summit with Kim Jong-un in February of this year. Uh, there's some speculation that it might be in Vietnam. It would be different from the Singapore summit last time. The announcement uh, that this second meeting will happen came after a visit by North Korea's top nuclear negotiator, where he apparently spent an hour and a half with Trump yeah. in the Oval Office, also met with Mike Pompeo. Um, the negotiations uh, since the Singapore summit have been stalled because, as everyone predicted, the North wants sanctions relief first, and yeah. we want them to dismantle their nuclear weapons program first. So, I mean, I guess... Uh, Again, I'm, I, I remain happy that we're talking. I remain happy that we're not tweeting about yep. fire and fury. But, like, do you think it's time for another summit? No. Um, I have to say, they've actually accomplished far less than I even <laughs> expected yeah. at this point. I mean, I thought that the North would do some symbolic things, right? They might right. blow up some nuclear sites and you know, ship some stuff out of the country, but not really get rid of their nuclear weapons or missiles. And they hadn't even really done that. Um, I hope that all this press that gave Trump kind of this clean shot uh, at having this summit appear historic, even though nothing was agreed to, uses the fact of this summit to highlight how much nothing has gotten done. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not giving up their nuclear weapons. Trump said that he'd solve this problem. Nothing's changed. They have nuclear weapons, they have missiles, right? Um, and it, the only thing that's changed is he's now praising Kim Jong-un, giving him legitimacy at home, probably having the sanctions regime fray a bit. Um, I am also struck, Tommy, by the difference in, you know, when we had the Iran negotiations, it was kind of like a constant process, right, with experts sitting together and meeting mm -hmm. and cabinet-level people, John Kerry, Ernie Moniz, our Secretary of Energy, meeting constantly with Iranian grinding counterparts, it grinding it out. This is just what is happening here? Yeah. You know, like we don't see anything. Presumably there's some secret discussions happening, but there's no appearance that there's kind of this, the work that needs to be done for a complex nuclear negotiation to how do they dismantle their nuclear infrastructure? How do they submit to an inspections and monitoring regime? None of that is apparent. Uh, and Trump seems to like the big splashy show. And, and again, for him to sit in the Oval, you know, in the Oval Office for an hour and a half with some kind of North Korean hack. I mean, my God, I'm trying to imagine if Barack Obama met with, and this will be the one time I do this on this podcast, <laughs> but if Barack Obama met with like the Iranian nuclear negotiator in the White House, mm. having gotten nothing in return for an hour and a half, it, it just seems like the North Koreans can flatter Trump and give him these occasional spectacles and get away with essentially keeping their nuclear weapons and missiles. Again, I think the Trump people will try to you know, hold up some symbolic concessions by the North at this meeting, um, you know, something about a commitment to denuclearize, maybe some show for the international press where they blow up a nuclear facility, but but my, my strong suspicion is they won't give up their nuclear weapons or their missiles. They'll want sanctions relief, they'll want international legitimacy, and, and the North Koreans will get it because they've been winning these negotiations. Well, so to your point, just days after they announced the second summit, uh, a think tank report identified another secret North Korean mm -hmm. missile base 160 miles northwest of Seoul. So this is this is one of roughly 20 undeclared missile bases. So it, it seems like not only are they not dismantling their program, it's actually getting worse, which to me was always part of yeah. the risk of these negotiations, yeah. which is the North Koreans can stall for time and actually strengthen their program and in increase their, their hand in the, in the leverage. Yeah, and again, we have to condition ourselves, you know, as with many things, Trump, this is not being covered normally. Like uh, a second summit with Kim Jong-un would be a huge story normally. It barely broke through in a government shutdown. Yeah. Uh, again, if we were looking at this in a normal circumstance, uh, this has really been a, a, a terribly run uh, circumstance where we've just been giving up all these things in North Korea in terms of uh, legitimizing Kim Jong-un, praising him, heaping praise on him for very little, if anything, in return. Um, you know, my fear is that the North Koreans can see the end goal two years from now, like a lot of countries, and they're playing for a scenario where Trump, after he leaves office, <coughs> they've got a nuclear deterrent. They've got their nuclear weapons in place. They've got their missile program in place. They've de facto been acknowledged, recognized by the United States. The sanctions regime is kind of unraveled. Yeah. And the new U.S. president has a new reality, which is accept acceptance of a North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. That's clearly the game they're playing. Everybody can see this. And, you know, the problem is it's so hard to evaluate what the Trump administration's actual play is. Like, could you... 
could you define what they think success is, Tommy? Like, no. do you have any idea from from Mike Pompeo, Donald Trump, like what they're trying to achieve in this negotiation? I I, I, I sincerely believe that for Trump, it's headlines. Yeah. Because he tweeted that the problem has been solved. Yeah. Um, it's it's deeply frustrating. And, and like, we should just be clear. I mean, again, glad there are negotiations, but the massive challenge yeah. of North Korea with sitting on 60 nuclear weapons, developing an ICBM that can deliver a warhead on the United States, changes the calculus for everyone in the region, for Japan, for yeah. South Korea, for us. I mean, it, it's, it's a destabilizing event. And I'll be honest, uh, I think it would be hard, if not impossible, for any administration to achieve through negotiations the full and complete mm -hmm. elimination of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. What I do think you could achieve is a lot more than what Trump has. Right. You know, if you held out the legitimization of this summit, if you squeezed the sanctions harder, if you were savvier with the Chinese and the other countries in the region, the capacity to at least get inspectors into these facilities and to at least see a rollback of North Korea's capabilities and, and to, to at least not be granting them you know, this kind of get out of jail free pass in terms of international opinion that Trump is, you could see a scenario where you might not completely eliminate this threat, but you could much more credibly roll it back. And said, as you say, Trump is not only not doing that, there's indications that the North is advancing their mm -hmm. programs while going through this charade. Yeah. Let's peer under the hood a little bit of, of the negotiations. The Wall Street Journal reported that North, the North Korea talks were in part made possible because there have been secret intelligence agency to intelligence agency talks between the U.S. and North Korea for years. So some of this reportedly happened during the Obama years. So you and I have to be uh, elliptical about talking about yeah. specifics. But I do think it's interesting because um, you have been involved yeah. in highly secret, sensitive negotiations with the Cubans. You you were yeah. in every single meeting about negotiations uh, regarding the Iran deal. Um, can you talk about how common it is that intelligence channels are the negotiations or that there's this private channel uh, and why it makes sense for intel folk to talk rather than, say, the State Department, yeah. the military, the vice president? Yeah, um, I think there are a number of reasons. I mean, one is when there are two countries that are total antagonists and don't have diplomatic relations, you know, we don't have an embassy in Pyongyang, for instance, the act of having a meeting in public or between our diplomats is a big deal and, and, and usually signals something. It signals a change in the relationship. So the ability to be able to talk discreetly out of sight allows you to explore whether you can make progress. So, for instance, when I was talking to Cubans, we kept those negotiations secret you know, because we didn't want to have to deal with pressure from within our two systems. We didn't want to deal with you know, their Communist Party hardliners criticizing talking to the United States or our congressional hardliners mm -hmm. criticizing that we were talking. So it just allows you an amount of discretion. I think another thing that's important is in systems like North Korea, they kind of take most seriously intelligence and security channels. You know, they're a police right. state, right? So the people who run their system are their intelligence people. So they assume <laughs> that that's who they should be talking to on our side. And, and again, I don't think it reveals much, you know, and some of this is in the journal. We used intelligence channels with the North Koreans in the Obama administrations. We established them, you know, just to take a public example, we sent Jim Clapper to North Korea to help get uh, an American who was detained in North Korea out of prison. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't think it's saying much beyond that to say that for some of these other issues around Americans detained in North Korea, often intelligence channels presented one way of communicating. Mm -hmm. I, for instance, was not surprised that the Trump channel grew out of a CIA discussion, you know, when Mike Pompeo was at the CIA. You know, that was in line, frankly, with the, the channels that, that, that had been established, or one of them at least. Um, I do think, however, you use the secret channel to set up the negotiation. Now, I mean, everybody knows there's a negotiation. Yep. And like I said, what I don't see on the Trump side is like, where's the expert team? Where are the nuclear experts and the sanctions experts? And, you know, we had a team on the Iran nuclear negotiations that had like, you know, dozens of people supporting it and nerds, you know, who knew about nuclear physics and nerds who knew about, you know, how to enforce sanctions and diplomats who could sit there for 12 hours in a room with the Iranians talking in circles, right? And, and I, all that effort was necessary to get to a, a, a deal. 
Um, here, I think they've made use of the intelligence channel, but I haven't seen it evolve into something bigger. Yeah, I haven't either. Uh, there's a great quote from our old friend, uh, Danny Russell, who is <laughs> an NSC official. He worked at the State Department on, on Asia issues during the Obama administration. He said, generally speaking, in countries like North Korea, the foreign ministry has limited influence. You need to be able to speak to the guys with the guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, but he also makes the case that, you know, so there's, there's a counterpoint to the it being a good idea to have these intel to intel channels, which is that... Uh, those are likely to be some of the worst actors in some of these yeah. systems. They're likely to yeah. care the least about human rights. They spy on their own people. They spy on others. But Danny points out in the journal story that in the event of a crisis, it's great to know who to call. Like, you don't want to be calling yeah. the North Korean switchboard yeah. if there's a nuclear standoff. So yeah. establishing these things early makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, it's it's smart, and and he's exactly right. It's kind of if there's something that blows up, if there's an incident out the Korean Peninsula. You know, you don't want uh, to be calling the North Korean ambassador at the U.N. or something. You want to be calling one of the guys with guns. I will say part of what makes people nervous as uh, negotiations evolve is our allies don't see the intelligence channel. You know, mm -hmm. so when we're in the Iran negotiations, once we move that into a diplomatic process instead of a secret process, you know, everybody who's at the table, the, our allies are at the table, the French, the British, the Germans, we brief the Israelis on everything that happened even when they didn't like it. And I think... I think, and based on some of my own conversations too, that the the South Koreans and particularly the Japanese feel a little bit <laughs> un, unsure that they know what's happening in these huh. talks, right? That we have this intelligence channel and all these secret conversations, and are we selling them out? You know, I mean, are, is Trump talking about pulling our troops out of South Korea? Uh, are we not talking about the things that the Japanese care about? Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, another risk of the intelligence channel is. It's so opaque that, that allies who have a real stake in the conversation feel shut out of it.